So what got you into the sleep world? Thank you for asking. I know we're both crazy passionate about it. It yeah. What got me into it was in 2005, um, I had a headache patient and I had many of my uh, clients or uh, patients at the time were daily headache sufferers. It was about half of my practice. And one, one of those patients demanded a sleep study and she was 32, not overweight. She was not the typical person who we were told to send for sleep studies at the time, nor was there anything written up connecting sleep to daily headache at the time. Uh, so I sent her for a sleep study sort of against my will because I wasn't really trained in it. In fact, I'd been trained like most physicians not to ask about sleep because then they'd want sleeping pills and it was too much trouble and it was addictive mm -hmm. and frightening. So she turned out to have sleep apnea, even though she didn't have a fat neck and all the things we were told to look for. More importantly, when she put on a CPAP device, which was weird for me because her head already hurt, like it was painful for her to put that on, but her headaches went away and they went away within a month. You know, she had been with me for two years, tried all the medicines that I had to offer. So there was a dramatic change in the way I thought about it. She did not have any drops in oxygen. So we're, we were being told and still are being told that the brain problems or the medical problems induced by sleep apnea are about drops in oxygen. And she didn't have any drops in oxygen. She had interruptions of her deep sleep, her paralyzed phases, but she did not have drops in oxygen, which then leaves us with, well, why did she get better? Like the, in my view, headache is a biochemical problem. It's inherited, has to do with the resting excitability of head pain. So I think of it in a very biochemical way. And that's made me think that perhaps it's just the interruption of whatever it is we're doing in deep sleep that doesn't allow her to make the chemicals that allow allows her to wake up with no pain in her head. That's a very challenging concept, but because I've been doing neurology for 25 years already and headache patients are very difficult, they don't mean to be difficult. It's just, we haven't really treated them effectively. I started sending all of them for sleep studies. So okay. over a period of about a year and a half, uh, in the early to about 2005 through 2010, I did over a thousand sleep studies in young, healthy people. And within the first couple of years, my pulmonologist, so it's a little strange that the pulmonologists were assigned mm -hmm. to, to actually make up a legend about why certain diseases are associated with sleep apnea. It's a little weird because there is a brain side to this that we'll, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about later, but it's the brain that paralyzes us during sleep. It's the brain that actually allows us to step between wake and sleep and go through the phases of sleep. Mm -hmm. So the airway is important, absolutely. But so my pulmonologist said, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but these tests that you're requesting, this is a completely different population of patients than what we're usually testing for sleep apnea. And I said, well, I know that, but these are all people with daily headache. And he said, well, I don't know if you've noticed this, but they have a very characteristic finding, which is they don't have much rapid eye movement sleep and their rapid eye movement sleep is very interrupted and they have REM related apnea. And I said, well, Chuck, that's not on the report. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, I know. And I was like, well, wait, I I've been struggling through this because some of them have apnea and some don't. And mm -hmm. all I have to offer the ones who don't have apnea is sleeping pills. But I've wondered why I would get these reports that it didn't seem to be consistent that they had apnea. So I couldn't actually give them CPAP, which made the ones with apnea better. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, yes, it's not on the report. So I had to learn how to read the actual background. So I'm a neurologist. I didn't do a sleep fellowship, mm -hmm. but it's easy to read those sleep studies. It's not difficult. Mm -hmm. You know about EEGs and you know about stages of sleep. And it turned out that these young, healthy females with daily headache had some really consistent findings. They were not able to get into rapid eye movement sleep. They were not able to stay in rapid eye movement sleep. And frequently their complaints were, I wake up at three o'clock and I can't go back to sleep. So there's a characteristic time frame. These women are frequently have no or few other medical problems. They've had a couple of babies. 
and that's it. Mm. And what they what they've actually done, I'm going to tell you what the end message is: is every child they bear is using up their vitamin D. So their vitamin D was going low. And when the vitamin D goes low, the microbiome of the intestine changes. Mm -hmm. So that having pregnancies actually makes a much higher incidence of that woman having sleep disorders and her children having sleep disorders for a specific deficiency state that's induced by pregnancy. This is very common now because we've all moved indoors. And when I give my lectures, mm -hmm. I say there's three ways to become vitamin D deficient. One, you don't go outside. Two, you get an excellent education and you become a professional. And then you don't dig in the earth anymore. You don't spend your time digging in the dirt, being a farmer. And the third is you have babies because each one of them sucks up your vitamin D. And that then leads to a change, not only in the D level, but in the microbiome that puts you and the baby at risk for the future. So at the time, I didn't know any of that. All I knew was these are young, healthy females with daily headache. Their sleep studies have very characteristic findings that no one was writing about. There's no one writing about, why don't, I, why don't my patients have rapid eye movement sleep? So I'm struggling for five years with this finding. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of it, Chuck also says to me, this is my pulmonologist, Chuck Perkins, I say, Chuck, why would they have REM-related apnea? Why would they only stop breathing in REM sleep? What's that about? He said, well, I think, I think we get the most paralyzed of all in rapid eye movement sleep. Mm -hmm. And I said, ooh, that's creepy. Why would we get paralyzed? And I said, well, why do we get paralyzed? He said, I don't know. Nobody really knows. But if you go back to the original DEMENT videos mm -hmm. coming out of Stanford, mm -hmm. they were the first ones to lesion this area of the brainstem nucleus pontus, reticularis, oralis, caudalis, this little stripe of cells in the lowest part of the brain that manages our paralysis and sleep. And they electrically lesioned that area. Cats would start hunting while they were clearly asleep. So they would get up and start walking around. So that observation from the 1960s has been well-documented since. And there are very specific cells that run our ability to get paralyzed correctly. If you think about that a little bit, it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Like how do we get paralyzed and not stop breathing? Because it turns out when you look at the anatomy of that stripe of cells, it also is able to paralyze the chest wall and the diaphragm. Those cells are sorted out anatomically. So one part is this, so you only paralyze this part mm -hmm. during REM sleep. Well, the first question would be, why do we get paralyzed at all? Now, I happen to be seeing, you know, a thousand patients over several years where I know they're not getting paralyzed correctly because their legs are kicking. That is what these periodic limb movements of sleep are. Right. And I start thinking of it as, well, if we get paralyzed, that could mean that these cells that are running the paralysis, if they get too paralyzed, because it's pretty obvious you have to get perfectly paralyzed to be able to live through this. I mean, that's, it's pretty frightening to think about getting paralyzed. You're vulnerable. Some big animal is going to jump on you. This mm -hmm. part of the brain is the same in the dinosaurs as it is in us. Mm -hmm. That means this paralysis thing was happening 250 million years ago. That also implies that this new finding of widespread sleep apnea throughout the globe. By this time, I'm looking at all the articles in every place, this is in the early 2000s, every part of the world where they're starting sleep study centers is showing that everybody do, to a, do a test on, mm -hmm. they may not have significant apnea, but their sleep studies are still not normal. Once you know what you're looking for mm -hmm. and you say, what is the percentage or what is the total time spent in deep sleep or REM sleep, these are not normal studies. That means this is a global epidemic that started actually to be reported in the 80s. And I know that because I was trained before. So mm -hmm. all of us, the older doctors who went to medical school in the 70s and 80s, that was really when DEMENT was starting this. The whole idea of sleep studies really didn't start until the early 70s. That means medical schools were not teaching about sleep disorders because partially they weren't that common. 
They're mm -hmm. very common now, especially in children, which is the saddest area. Right. But at the time, that means we didn't really have an epidemic of sleep disorders, or at least that's the way it seems to me. And I was growing up in San Jose, and my it was my generation who was actually the first group of medical students and and college students who are being studied for demence studies of what are normal sleep studies look like in young people. Okay. So if we look at the incidence of sleep disorders, they start to be reported in the 80s and have just continued to be more and more epidemic. Mm -hmm. So in the background, I'm wondering what caused this. Why are the humans around the planet wearing CPAP devices? None of the other animals are. This okay. is happening in humans, okay? Mm -hmm. That's weird, and it's really over a 40-year span. And for five years, I was giving sleeping pills and CPAP prescriptions. And they work, sort of. If you get the sleep better, the headaches are better. I now started by about four years into this. So this is getting towards about 2008 or nine. I was really willing to do sleep studies on anyone because as soon as I'm doing my weekend work in the hospital and seeing stroke patients, it's obvious they have sleep disorders. Mm -hmm. Once you start to get crazy about sleep and realize that really it's the only place we heal, then you can't help but think, well, could that mean that my first focus on every single neurologic patient should be what is their sleep like? Wow. Like there are very few diseases that really are not linked to sleeping well. So it's easier to list the things that aren't linked to sleeping well. But most people, if you think about it, oh, I develop X, whatever it is, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, because I'm not healing my body correctly in sleep. So if you look through that lens instead, what you get is, oh, I just spent the last 30 years fixing the destruction that manifested in this person. And each person manifests what their own genetic weaknesses are. But if they had been healing normally, they would never have come to see me. And now I'm about 55. I'm getting perimenopausal when this was happening. Mm -hmm. I would like to be able to sleep better. My sleep is terrible. And I, you know, I'm using estrogen and progesterone. So I don't have a good excuse, you know. So I'm looking through at a different lens thinking, well, I don't want to take those medicines that I give out once mm -hmm. my sleep goes bad. And all we're really being told by the sleep experts is old people don't need to sleep as much. Mm -hmm. I don't see it that way anymore. Right. I think that we start aging when we don't sleep as well. And that can be in childhood or it can be in old age. So I'm building up all these ideas about, well, I don't know. I think that the sleep is the most important thing to know about. Let me take a break there and ask if you have yeah. any. Yeah, I, I was just amazed. It sounds like the the clinical findings and your own curiosity actually lead to a whole change of the structure, how you think clinically. Yes. Right? I hear something really interesting here. I want to emphasize that a lot of people think if we have this, this, this problem, then we don't sleep well. Actually, that's a common issue I know in the medical field in China. Uh, a lot of people told me doctors in China, because they are not well trained in sleep. So they often think if you have insomnia, that's because you have anxiety, depression, and many other things. So basically, you have some problems then lead to you don't sleep well. But what you mentioned sounds like a lot of that you start thinking, well, in that sleep is that because sleep is more fundamental? Like if you don't sleep well, that actually in a way generates other problems yes, and then absolutely. other problems come back to make sleep even worse. And then you got caught in this negative loop. I, I think that's a beautiful summary. And I had this incredible shift of the way, and I've been practicing neurology for 25, 30 years. And I just assume we've been trained so much that it's all about genetics. But the thing that's bad about that is if I've just presented as a, as a patient with my second seizure, let's just use epilepsy as an example, and there's no brain tumor, and we're thinking this is a genetic disorder. And in fact, 
If you look at that person's family, they have other family members who've had epilepsy, okay? Let's say we have a genetic marker for this particular family and we're able to test. And there are 35 people and we've tested all 35 and eight of them have the genetic marker. Those eight, four of them have had a seizure. Four of them have the genetic marker, but have never had a seizure. And two out of that four have to be on seizure medicine. Two of them just had one seizure. Now, if I'm the 19 year old who's in the office with me, I think it's perfectly reasonable for that 19 year old to say, can't you turn me into one of my relatives who has this marker, but has never had a seizure? Hmm. I never thought of it that way, but I think, you know, I'm doing all of these sleep studies in my headache patients. Headache is actually a genetic disorder of excitability as well. Why am I not asking my epilepsy patients how they feel when they wake up in the morning? Hmm. Because I already know I'm giving them these stupid medicines that make them tired and stupid. So it, it took me a couple of years before I went, wait, every single genetic disorder has this range of actually, are they clinically affected by this? And that means that if this person has the same gene that their cousin has, but their cousin sleeps better, maybe their brain is able to shore up or fix that genetic weakness, okay? So I'm thinking of it in a totally different way. Every single person who sees me in neurology or stroke or anything, where they've had a medical challenge also has this second treatment path. What if I can make them sleep better? I can make them heal their stroke damage better. And in actual fact, as I'm standing next to the bedside as a physician, I realize I'm not making the brain heal. The brain is healing itself. Mm -hmm. How does it do that? That's, a, that's once you get into that a little bit more in depth, that is miraculous. We are self assembling self-repairing organisms we repair every night and we actually repair and we wake up to look the same in the mirror you know i mean it would freak us out if we look different but there are people who actually have growth hormone problems who look different that means the our body actually knows how to do all, all these things that we physicians we're not even close to it now the, the other thing that's important about that is I don't really have to know how exactly the sleep happens, okay? I, I am put off by the amazing depth of information that there is. I love biochemistry. I read the articles about REM on, REM off cells and all, and any article that you actually want to look at that's a summary of how we sleep, there are 22 arrows. Every five years, there are diagrams with more arrows. I don't actually have to be able to duplicate that as a clinician. I don't have to know every little bit of it. Mm -hmm. What I have to know is why did this go bad? Because mm -hmm. if the dinosaurs were sleeping effectively and dominated the planet for millions of years, they were successfully sleeping because it's when they slept that they learned. Mm -hmm. They have to know which animals to eat and which animals to mate with. They have to know where the food is. They have to know how to keep their children safe. They have a learning process, a memory process, a judgment, how to deal with being afraid of being killed by another animal. All of those things were perfectly set up in a dinosaur brain. Mm -hmm. That means this is such an old engineering diagram. So for the, for the first time, I'm thinking of it more like, what if you Chan asked me to design a way, so I'm thinking of it as a software engineer because that was my population I was treat, you know, that I had it in California. What if I were asked to design a process to have a self repair? Mm -hmm. What would that entail? That's a really, really different question than how do I understand sleep? Okay. Right. Now, having said all that, I was only having partial success with my patients. So they were using CPAP. I was using a lot of sleeping pills by now. I really didn't want the sleeping pills. They didn't want the sleeping pills, but that's all I had. So we're intervening chemically and we're intervening with this sleep CPAP mask. 
And then about 2009, one of my patients comes in, she's 18, she's beautiful. She's about to go off to college. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at her sleep study. She came to see me because she had daily headache. Her headaches are gone with the medicine I gave her. But she says, I'm so tired. I sleep fine, but I'm so tired. She sleeps for 10 hours. I have a sleep study in front of me that's 10 solid hours during which she has no deep sleep. Oh, she no. has no slow wave sleep, no REM sleep. Every, every couple of minutes, 35 times an hour, she wakes to light sleep. There's oh, no wow. drop in oxygen. There's no clear respiratory reason for her to do this. Hmm. And I'm looking at this going, this is terrible. What must be wrong with her? Mm -hmm. She asked me, is there anything you can do for my fatigue? And I say, I don't know how to do that. That's, that's your primary's problem. Cause I, anyway, I do her thyroid tests and her B12 and her B12 level is profoundly low. Oh, mm. because I am an MD, I have been very successfully trained away from vitamins. Okay. In the 1980s, medicine started to say that the vitamins were really the purvey of uh, lesser humans like dietitian and nutritionists, females, of course. So I was successfully trained against them, but I am sitting with a group of thousand people who do not sleep and we don't have an answer and they don't have sleep apnea. They just wake up, can't go back to sleep. They're young, healthy females generally. Now I have lots more who have Parkinson's or have a stroke, et cetera. And there's no one explaining this. And I'm reading these nerdy articles because I happen to be interested in electrophysiology. So for the first time, I'm actually reading articles about somebody like the studies at Stanford and other sleep centers where they have a hair-like electrode that's placed in this little dopaminergic pacemaker cell that's firing at a certain rate in the brainstem. And I'm thinking about that because one, I thought this is the weirdest thing. I don't know why these guys did this experiment, but they've got this recording device and then they're dropping chemicals on these little cells and they're seeing that the firing rate goes up when you drop mm -hmm. norepinephrine, the firing rate goes up. When you drop acetylcholine, the firing rate goes down. They're thinking of how these cells, and this is my thought about the paralysis, how they're managing to keep us perfectly paralyzed. Because for us to be paralyzed, in, in a biologic way, I have to be sending a certain firing rate of messages. So if I wanna keep my arm right here, I'm actually giving an up signal at a certain rate, a down signal at a certain rate. Mm -hmm. So firing rates of the neurons is how we make our body paralyzed, but don't die. So I'm thinking of this in this very, very nerdy way, but then I see this B12 level and I think, wow, what if these cells in the brain are B12 deficient. I don't even know what B12 does, but I know it's about the repair in the cell and this little cell has to repair itself at the same time it's firing all the time. So the, I'm getting to the final end, which is mm -hmm. I'm thinking about sleep on a single cell basis, wow. which is not anything that any normal person would ever do. Okay. Right. I'm thinking of it from this anatomy that I'm seeing in the textbooks that shows this stripe of cells and thinking of each one of them personally. So now B12 might be deficient in those cells. What if these sleep disorders in these young, healthy people are really a vitamin deficiency? That would be so cool. So mm -hmm. I start sending them off for B12 shots mm -hmm. and they, um, I don't know anything about B12 deficiency, which is a pity because it turns out that if you go to the neurology textbooks, and look for B12 deficiency, you'll find headache listed. But if you go to the neurology textbooks and you look under headache, mm -hmm. B12 deficiency is never mentioned. Oh, if wow. You Google B12 deficiency, however, what you get is chronic fatigue, daily headache. Huh. Now, that to me was really challenging. For the first time, I thought, okay, maybe what we're looking at here is daily headache caused by a sleep disorder. The sleep disorder is the primary problem. But why would these young, these women are doing paleo, they're you know, long distance runners, they, they aren't unhealthy. Why would they have this? So I'm thinking of this population, which is very special as healthy people, instead of saying, oh, you have blah, blah, blah. So I can blame you for your own disease. So B12 turns out to help. And my patients start to come back 
they say, yeah, I get my B12 shot and I have two good nights and then 28 bad ones. And actually they gave me the little vial and some syringes. So I'm giving my shot once a week, but I get two good nights and then five or six bad ones. I'm like, this is fascinating. This There's a huge B12 literature for sleep already. Mm. So I haven't gone down that path very extensively because of what I'm going to tell you about, but it opens this whole way of thinking of it differently. Is it possible that the cells that actually run my ability to transition into these sleep phases, which by the way, are run by neurotransmitters, is it possible that these neuro, that I could be neurotransmitter deficient in some way because of a deficiency state in my body? Okay. So that's the question. Yeah. I start to do B12 levels. Yeah. That's what I was like. Wow. This would change everything. We could give back something. I don't think it's normal to put on a CPAP mask. That's not normal. The only goofball who would think of doing that would be a doctor, you know, just because we're always addressing the thing that walks in the door, whatever walks in the door, I have to figure out a way to, to help it or fix it. And we're not really fixing the disease in the background. And I say that because by now I've been using CPAP in my patients for four or five years. And the fourth year they come back and go, I'm still wearing it. I wear it every night. But remember when I, the first year I was wearing my CPAP, I got down to one blood pressure medicine. I got off all of my pills for diabetes. My pain went away. I felt fantastic. I am still wearing my CPAP, but I do not feel as good. I'm back on three blood pressure medicines. So there's something getting worse. There's the disease process in the background that we have missed. We're, we're putting a Band-Aid on it, okay? And the same thing with the sleeping pills. And so then I do a bunch of B12 levels and everybody who's got a sleep study with me, no matter what their diagnosis is, I start to do B12 levels thinking that maybe we could help them. And then one of my patients who ironically was actually a sleep expert oh. and ran a CPAP lab or a sleep lab and would give us so she was on disability because she had so many medical problems she said you know my doctor did my vitamin d level and she gave me vitamin d my wrist pain went away and i said well I, okay let's just throw it in there i really had no focus on any vitamin you know i'm not knowledgeable but i'm drawing blood anyway i said let's do the vitamin d level i was thinking of it more as oh it helped her bone pain because you know these are bone vitamin so but the there's another piece in the background which is if I give a CPAP device to someone who has sleep apnea and has leg movements, one of the things that was weird is in these young, healthy females, very active, very knowledgeable about their health, they had a lot of pain. They've got ankle pain or knee pain or hip pain or back pain. And I really didn't think that 32 year olds should have any pain, mm -hmm. but their leg movements on the sleep study are not really being treated. They're there. We talk about them, but we don't talk about how they happen. So mm -hmm. if I'm putting a CPAP mask on, I'm treating the airway paralysis. But if you think of those paralysis cells as wobbling back and forth, when they get too mm -hmm. paralyzed, you stop breathing. Mm -hmm. When you're not paralyzed enough, your legs are moving. And it turns out there's an old walking nucleus, a very ancient walking nucleus right in that same stripe. And those periodic limb movements are actually alternating. That's why they're called periodic. And they're walking movements. Well, what if their ankle pain is because their feet are still moving while they're sleeping? Hmm. I had been thinking about that, puzzling about it, because I had some eight-year-olds who had those movements and sleep hmm. apnea. That it's not that they have multiple illnesses. Like, why would I assign multiple sleep disorders to this poor little eight-year-old? You know, maybe there's one central diagnosis, which is these striped cells of paralysis are not functioning in their well. So I'm thinking of it that way. And so we throw in vitamin D. And so for four months between August of 2009 and December of 2009, I've got D levels and B12 levels on all of these people. And I'm writing out these lab slips every night and everybody's D is low, which is particularly ironic because it's in August to December. Like if they're going to have normal wow. Ds, it'll be after summer. So, right. so you got a lot of data from this. Yes, I, I did. Yeah. Now, keep yeah. in mind, I am not a scientist. I'm just sitting in my office in private practice, 
I've got all the, I'm just curious and no one is helping these people and I'm not sleeping either. And I, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm part of a shared group that's not really being addressed in any way. Mm -hmm. So all the Ds are low. I'm sending out all these lab slips. And then two guys come in the last week that were open just before the Christmas break and say, you know, I'm still using my CPAP. I use it every night, but it didn't take my headaches away. But that little note you sent me last time I was in here about my D, I went and bought the vitamin D. And about three weeks later, my sleep got better. My headaches went away. Two guys, both of them tell me the same thing. They're both on CPAP. It turns out their D levels were a little higher than the women, mm. but they both have this clinical observation. You made me take D, my sleep got better. My headaches went away. So mm -hmm. what I did for that week of our break is I went to PubMed. So PubMed in December of 2009, if you put in sleep and vitamin D, there are no hits. Those two search terms, oh, nothing. Wow. But, and that first article was actually published in January, just a single clinical report. Okay. But if you type in vitamin D in the brain, what you get is a huge amount of literature and there are vitamin D receptors in this stripe of cells that paralyze us. The nucleus pontus reticularis oralis caudalis. Like, who would even know about that? Who would study that? No, there's a guy named Walter Stump who's published in the in the eighties that this stripe that paralyzes has vitamin D receptors all over it. Also, the two parts where the clock function, the locus ceruleus and the substantia nigra, where those little dopamine cells were, that always tell us what time it is and when we're supposed to be going to sleep and transitioning. They have vitamin D receptors. And I'm looking at that going, if this is a bone vitamin, why the hell would it be in the brain? And there are all these other parts of the brain that are affected. And I step back for a minute and think, this has got to be how hibernation is controlled. So it makes perfect sense that it would be, and I dump into Walter Stump's literature, which is profound and very smart. In the early 80s, he starts, he was an endocrine chemist, and he also happened to be a neurologist. So he spent his career testing where hormone receptors were. His first work was about estrogen receptors in the brain. But unfortunately, the rest of the vitamin D industry, so let's say the vitamin D, other vitamin D experts don't necessarily agree with his point of view. His point of view was simply placed, oh, this is a hormone we make on our skin that affects our fertility, our ability to hibernate, therefore metabolism, and obviously sleep. So I call this guy up, I read a bunch of his articles, mm -hmm. I call him up and I say, hey, I don't see a single article about vitamin D and sleep. You have written a lot of articles. Luckily he was retired, so he took my phone call and he was really smart. Oh. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about this, but I have this clinical observation, which is all of my patients who have terrible sleep studies have vitamin D deficiency. Has anybody written about that? And he says, no, but that makes perfect sense. It runs hibernation. Of course, it'll run our sleep. Like he already actually demonstrated that vitamin D was talking to this part of the brainstem. So from approximately 2000, early 2010 to 2012, my I had a very simple question. If all of my patients and I are suffering not able to sleep, not able to transition into sleep. And by the way, insomnia is completely avoided. You know, what you just said about, oh, you must have insomnia because you have these things that we can blame you for. You just can't handle stress. You just can't handle blah, blah, blah. Well, that doesn't help anyone. If I don't have right. a way- That's horrible. Yeah. It, is, it means yeah. we're blaming our patients for their own disease, really which is right. a way I, as the clinician, get to step back and feel that I'm not responsible, but it doesn't right. really help them. Mm -hmm. And I realized over time, as I began to ask questions that most people would not tell you because they'd already had bad experiences. As soon as you say, how's your sleep? And they say, I can't sleep. Then they back away from it because they don't want to give you sleeping pills. So insomnia is basically ignored. Mm -hmm. And that means if we had a way to say, all of these cells that are very basic, this is really the switching mechanism. It's not what's happening in the cortex. Most of sleep is being studied at the cortical level. What are we doing? Because when we put electrodes here, we can do waves. If you put electrodes along the neck, 
where the brainstem is, you don't get anything valuable. That means you can't put one of those hair-like electrodes into somebody's brainstem in a human. That means we've got rats and we've got single cells, but we don't look at what's the brainstem function. These problems with falling into sleep, with having attacks of sleep, with all the range of the sleep disorders, they are all really basically either clock problems or paralysis problems. And I start to think of it that way, which is a very, very different way than sleep is currently being looked at. And so with that simplification, now I'm really concentrating on the function of these cells in the brainstem. So I had this very simple question. If they all have a low vitamin D levels, and it's a blood level, it is not a dose, it's a blood level. Is there a vitamin D blood level that will make my patients come in and say, my sleep is better? Very simple, very simple. Like, hey, how's your sleep? Like not, there's no trackers. How's your sleep? And then you know what? Humans can talk. Humans know whether the sleep is better or not. Okay, so this is a very simple prospective no control, the patient is their own control. And I just say, how's your sleep? It turns out that having a D level from 60 to 80 makes the sleep better. As soon as they get over 60, they start to feel different. So for a full two years, I'm doing that. It's very difficult to learn about how to dose D. It is extremely controversial at the moment, very political. Mm -hmm. So one, it's not the dose, it's the level, it's a hormone like thyroid, you can't just say, hey, you and I think the things you just told me, all mm -hmm. those things, they're probably related to your thyroid. Why don't you run down to CVS and buy yourself some thyroid hormone? I'll see you back in a year. Like even lay people who've never had any instruction in endocrinology would go, wait a minute, my aunt, you know, she's went on thyroid and she was really cranky when it was too high and too low, okay? Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. lay people know every hormone has a tight little narrow band. Okay. Mm. And you have to stay there for it to work. Mm. So there was a lot of learning about that. And it is very, it, it's difficult, but very consistent. Now I've been doing this for over 10 years, 60 to 80 is where the sleep gets better. Now, oh, wow. this next part is the most important part of this interview. The next part was we published the article in 2012 saying that the epidemic of sleep disorders happening over the last 40 years coincides with computers, air conditioning, sunscreen, intellectual development and staying inside with them. So less sun exposure has coincided with this. And there's beautiful science to show vitamin D should be linked to our sleep. So we published that, but soon after that, we all start to fail again. So my sleep starts to get worse. I happen to have restless leg syndrome, which I have not been able to fix in myself, which is really important because I experience what it's like to have this weird thing happen to me that's not my fault, that happens in relationship to being drowsy. It only happens when I get to the drowsy phase. It happens, and then, so I take Mirapex, I take a dopamine medicine. I'm very motivated to figure that out and make it go away if possible. So we're studying that, we get the article published, and then my sleep gets worse, all my patient's sleep gets worse. They come back and they say, my headaches are back, my D level 65, don't even ask me, um, but they're failing. And then a couple of people in my practice come back and they're both young females, like in their forties, they don't have diabetes, they don't have any other medical problems. And because remember, I fell into the B12 literature at the beginning, everyone who, who was B12 low was on B12. So they're both on B12 and they both say, I have this burning in my hands and feet. Oh. just started and I was very uncomfortable because my subspecialty is neuropathy that's where I did my training and burning in the hands and feet just doesn't walk in the door very often burning in the feet a little more common and if the patient has diabetes that they can find no matter how mild they'll blame it on that but walking in the door already on B12, because sometimes B12 takes the burning away, but they walk in the door with burning in the hands and feet within a month of each other. And it all started at the same time in these two. And the only thing they have in common is they've been taking D because I told them to. Oh. That makes me feel like, uh-oh, this stuff is doing something that I don't understand. And it turns out once you start to get into D, our level of understanding of it is 
is pitiful uh, oh, as obviously limited. Mm. very limited mm. so this burning in the hands and feet was really scary and then a patient walked in with a book and that book was about pantothenic acid which is another vitamin mm. that is a vitamin that no one studies because every single book says pantothenic acid deficiency doesn't exist because it's in every food that's what it says in all the books so she walks in with this book. She hands it to me. I'm against vitamins. So I, of course, don't read it. And then when she's going to come back, I had promised her that I would be more open-minded than most physicians. So I read it. And what it says in the book is very interesting. It's about treating rheumatoid arthritis with this chemical B5. And the pain that they're experiencing gets better. Their inflammation gets better, but their sleep gets better. That's why she brought it to me. She mm. knows I'm a crazy person about sleep. So I go to the references in this book and the references are from the 1950s in these really creepy experiments where these convicts are being tested in this little lab next door to the Iowa State Prison, which is of course illegal now. But at the time they're doing weird things like tube feeding them. So they were using a tube feeding method of non-food and blocking B5 and within two weeks, what they produced was a funny puppet-like gait, belly issues, insomnia, and burning in the hands and feet. So they showed that blocking this particular vitamin causes this burning in the hands and feet. The book is about using 400 milligrams of pantothenic acid. So I think, you know what? No one's writing about this. I'm just going to go and get this pantothenic acid, and I go to the vitamin store to use it myself. Wow. By this time, I'm doing everything my patients are doing, okay, which is right. a peculiar, not usual in medicine. But I think it's one of the smartest things you can do. You really then begin to get oriented with the way your patients are experiencing what's happening to you. Yeah, you're trying everything on your own, like try. Yes, to, I mean, yeah, understand. we're told not to do that. But to be truthful, we're just two human beings sitting in the room together, stumbling mm -hmm. through this, okay? Mm -hmm. That's really what... Patients do feel comfortable with that. It gets a little bit, it's a hard to get to that point because mm -hmm. they're trained that I'm supposed to be some sort of a special human mm -hmm. in a special category, but that's not true. We, so at any rate, what happens is I go to the vitamin store, I buy this 400 milligrams of panathenic acid. I know nothing about it. So I'm really insecure. I'm there and I'm looking at the B complexes and I think, you know, in medical school, the only thing I remember about the B vitamins is if you give one, you should give all of them. And I don't even know how many there are. I just go, okay, I'm going to have to go home and read about this. But I go to the B complex section and there's like a huge array. Some of them have three Bs, some have five Bs, some have eight Bs. And I'm like, holy moly, I don't know what to do here. And I pick up this stuff that's called B100. B100 oh. has eight Bs. 100 milligrams or 100 micrograms of each. So it's a large dose. It's non-proprietary, which means it's named B100. The importance of that is I can go back and say, I don't give out vitamins to people. I give them the recommendation. So my experience has been one, I don't want to charge them for some name brand vitamin. I'm not interested in profiting off these vitamins, which is a huge industry in the United States now. Mm -hmm. The second one is I want them to be staying close to what I've told them to do. So I will have to tell them to find this B. You just say B complex. It could be a million different things. So I go back and for the first week, I'm taking B100 and, and 400 milligrams of panathenic acid. And I'm taking it without a thought because we're taught the B vitamins get peed out. You can never hurt anyone with B vitamins. We don't have any stores. That's what we were taught. I do that for a week and I give out the same recommendation to everyone who has come back saying I have new pain, the two gals with the burning, I have problems with my walking, they all have a sleep study, they all have D levels. The only thing that's unique about them is they've been on D for two years, okay? So I give them this recommendation and by Friday, I realize my restless legs is infinitely worse. I'm starting to jump around like a jumping bean in the morning, I'm uncomfortable all day long, and I realize I have just missed again in the dose. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking 400 milligrams plus B100, which means 500 milligrams of panathenic acid. And I think, okay, this is just like the D. All the things they write that I read all these scientific articles are all wrong. And I've just screwed up my patients. I just gave this recommendation out for a week. And people are going to come back and yell at me. So I stopped the 400 milligrams of panathenic acid. 
I take B100 instead because I'm trying to adjust the dose. And in a in one day, my sleep is wonderful mm. and all my pain goes away. I had this oh. peculiar buttock pain that didn't have anything to do with what I was doing. I hadn't heard it, didn't have to do with my running. I had this really weird butt pain and it all goes away, which is also like something that I as a physician would not believe, okay? Mm. So then my patients start to come back and I stop giving that recommendation for a long time until they come back and 30 out of 40, I've given to them 40, a total of 40 over that week, 30 out of 40, bring back that stuff. And they go, Hey, this panathenic acid, it nearly killed me. Were you trying to hurt me? It made me so agitated and anxious and I couldn't sleep at all. And I'm like, wait, this is not what it said in that book. Okay. Not what it, it's when you see something like that, it means this chemical is also powerful in sleep mm. because what we got with the D was when we ran it over 80, couldn't sleep again. So that means that all of these now dogma that have been all the dogma that's been created about the B vitamins in the last four years is also wrong, which I'm like, why, why would they write things that are not so I have this experience of 30 people coming back and saying exactly the same thing to me. I got so agitated, I couldn't sleep at all. Well, the first question is, what's different about this group than the group that was in this book that got mm -hmm. so much better? Well, one is they're all on D. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it through a different lens, it turns out now that we all know D is about the immune system, that everybody who has lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, all has low D. And to give you the final answer, since we're getting towards the end, D is also extremely pivotal for establishing the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So the final question was, could it be that they got B vitamin deficient, not because of the food, because we've been told that the B vitamins come from the food. What if they really don't? What if they come from the poop bacteria? Because if you read the B vitamin review articles over the time, that was about 2013, they all say, oh, this B vitamin thiamine has a colonic bacteria source and a food source. Riboflavin also has a bacteria source and a food source. That every single one of these bees comes from the microbiome that lives inside us, but they've never been brave enough to step forward and say, you know, the reason why there are eight bees, like that's weird. There's A and then eight bees and then C, D, E. Like why, why is that? It's because they all eight come from four particular species or four phyla of bacteria that are the normal healthy foursome of the normal human microbiome. And those bacteria have been known since the 1920s to trade these chemicals. In fact, they were all reported as bacterial growth factors before the idea of vitamins ever actually came. Now, that is a long, long story to lead up to. It turns out if you take D and you don't bring back your microbiome, you will eventually produce a sleep disorder that links back to acetylcholine. So the final trip for me was, I don't know why they're having insomnia, but that's acting like a drug. Like you give them this B5 stuff and something dramatic happens. That's like me giving my Adderall medicines, okay? Mm. are not supposed to act like that. You know, they're supposed to be completely benign. No, this stuff, B5 goes right up into your head and boom, you either feel fantastic or you feel terrible and it really affects sleep. It affects anxiety. Mm. All these things that you were mentioning at the beginning, mm -hmm. you have insomnia because of these things they all relate back to a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Once you see that chemical pathway, it becomes obvious that this can't B5 cannot be in every food because if I varied what I ate, mm -hmm. my sleep would vary also. And right. it turns out that that's a lie. It's not in every food. It's not in any food. It's only made by the intestinal bacteria. That comes back around to a final conclusion, which is, oh, when I moved indoors, I affected my biology in two major ways. My D went down, which it by itself affects my sleep and my immune system and a hundred other things. And as that D went down, my microbiome changed 
And the population in my belly also directly plays a role in these eight chemicals that I have to have to have normal biochemistry, not only in sleep, but mostly in sleep. And actually those chemicals, the eight building blocks of repair are what are used when we sleep better. So this then gives a conclusory comment, which is, oh, there's a way to reverse all this. You can actually give back the things that the brain has been lacking and start mm -hmm. to see it sleep better. Because this is kind of a complicated um, set of dominoes that all fell, mm -hmm. I have a workbook on my website that tells you exactly what to test, mm -hmm. exactly what to take, and how to observe in your own body, I must be deficient in X or Y. It's only B12 that has pertinent blood levels. So it's a really different way of practicing healing mm -hmm. than what I experienced in the past. It's not really about, it's a little bit more like Eastern medicine in a general sense in that you're observing what your body says about things you're putting in your mouth. And it's not just ever one variable. Mm -hmm. And then you say, is my sleep better? Is my pain better? Is my anxiety better? And then it, that helps you decide what your body wants at the moment. So it's a very different way of looking at helping sleep, but it is the most successful thing I have ever seen in my patients. And now what I say on my website is over 8,000 people have been helped. Some of those were my patients. I stopped practicing in 2016 because I wanted to do this and medicine doesn't pay for talking Mm -hmm. uh, or giving vitamins. So mm -hmm. now I'm a sleep coach and I've tried to make a path for normal humans who are not scientists to follow this path to make their sleep better. Mm. Wow. Such a long journey. It's, uh, I definitely hear a lot of turns, a lot of like, you know, transformations in the process, right? Yep. And yeah, one of the biggest transformations sounds like how huh, if we don't use medication, what are other things? Actually, there's something lacking. And what's the role of that means in that? I hear B12, B5, and D. So those are things I feel like it's unique for you to do this because you have a really great medical background and you you know the neurons you know all this like a uh, um, biological part of human being more than anyone else i'm a psychologist i treat insomnia using cognitive behavior strategies yes. right but if you want to ask me something about our nerve system our neurobiology I was like, hmm, that, that's my weakness. So I feel like you, it's understandable how you go down that path, especially after collecting a lot of clinical data and then start really thinking a different way of treatment. And that's, I have to say, that's the first time I hear like about all this. Yeah. How that means. That's why I have a website. I would, yeah. I was planning to retire and flip houses. That's what my husband and I do. I mean, I do. I do the plumbing and he does the electrical. This is so powerful and it's such a totally different way of thinking. I mm -hmm. sent next to Emmanuel Mignot at mm -hmm. this sleep research meeting two weekends ago. And I didn't know who he was at the time I had this conversation. And I'm kind of embarrassed because I was like talking to, you know, I, once you get me at what I, I, this is the first sleep research um, society meeting I went to, and it was so amazing. But, I was there too. I did not see you. I was oh, there. terrific. Okay. So I loved the meeting. Uh, in fact, when I went to the sleep meetings, I realized that all the ones that the lectures I want to go to are this SRS. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting next to him and we start talking and I realize who he is mm -hmm. and that he's sort of Mr. Narcolepsy. And I said, you know, there's some clinical observations that show that REM behavioral disorder is really an acetylcholine deficiency. And many of the people who present with idiopathic hypersomnia, which is what he does all day long, idiopathic hypersomnia is frequently preceded in the 20 to 30 years before by having this REM behavioral disorder. The patient doesn't tell you about it because it's their spouse that complains. So they wind up just being asleep all the time during the day and they've transitioned through that into another. And I said, look, there were these clinical events that happened 
And so I tell him what happens. And it was an accident. This guy gives back B-50 to his wife. You know, he was giving B-50 to his wife. So there was a, a series of clinical accidents that made it obvious that REM behavior goes away. You get him to the right place with the D, you give him B-50, it just goes away. Poof. Like you get to the right dose. And now I've done that with like 20 people. And he said, well, that sounds like idiopathic hypersomnia to me, but I never would have thought of using vitamins. And I said, I wouldn't have either. Like who's, who would? There'd be no reason. And then you also wouldn't have a context in which to say, oh, I've been following this woman for two years and here's the baseline of what her sleep is like and everything. And we take away this B50 that her husband's been giving her that I didn't know about. And I would never have acknowledged that a B complex could do anything. He takes it away and then he calls me up two days later and says, she's beaten me up all night and now I can't wake her up again. It happened overnight. And again, it was something that as a neurologist, I was like, this is too weird. I mean, I no one's gonna believe me. They already think I'm nuts with this vitamin D stuff. So the reason why I was at the SRS was to try to encourage other basic scientists to look at it because no one's doing research in acetylcholine because there are no drugs. Nicotine mm. is the only drug. Yeah, no money behind it. Huh? There, are, there is no profit except oh. we're all failing from it mm -hmm. and we would all benefit. So I actually had some uh, pretty good introductions. So I'm sending them scientific articles. All the little dots are in a line now. There are people showing that there's B5 deficiency in the brain of Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, all these neurologic processes and they did that by accident too. No one cares about B5. In fact, the guy who wrote that, a guy named Cooper says, well, how could there be B5 deficiency in the brain when every single resource says there's no panathenic acid deficiency because it's in every food? He's he's wondering the same things I did. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I'm actually going to get him on the show. I talked to him in the uh, in the conference. Did you really? He's in, in Stanford, right? So... I was like, I listened to his lecture within Stanford before. Yeah. Wait, I I want to I want to I want to know about that. Will you send me when when you're going to talk to him? Sure, I' gonna have to contact him. He he asked me to email him, and then I' gonna schedule. I know oh, he's that, easy, so I don't know when so I can get cool. him. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And I I want to compliment you for having the open mindedness to look into this area, because. Most of the time, my people who are not MDs, who are just curious, find this very interesting, just like I did. Like it goes against a lot of the things that I was taught. I don't, I don't use these chemicals in the same way I would have. I was trained with, I have the lab results, therefore I'm the smart one and you're supposed to shut up and listen to me. That doesn't work in this. You really have to have a good dialogue with the person and each individual has to have the confidence to say, I can manage these things and then listen to my own body. It's right. very satisfying, but different than the way medicine is practiced now. Yeah, which is also important because I can see it's more and more diverse now, uh, not only in medicine, but also in mental health treatment. Absolutely. And this is all about mental health. In fact, if you would like, there are whole different ways to look at this in pregnancy, delivery. So I have videos that are about infertility that are about doing this program during pregnancy and breastfeeding your baby. There's a lot of literature about D levels in breastfeeding moms and in pregnant moms and getting the microbiome back. Those bees are pivotal for early fetal development. And the source of those bees have always for 250 million years been the GI tract of the mom who's carrying the baby. That means you have to look at this through a different lens. You know, prenatal vitamins are not controlled in this country and they don't have what women need. So you also can connect a bunch of literature about autism and endocannabinoids mm -hmm. from the belly. So right. we could do another hour that's all about- Oh, definitely. I would love that. And I'm also thinking we should do a live broadcast too, if you want. I'd be thrilled to do that. Yeah, so because I'm trying to build a, a English YouTube channel, I don't know how many people are going to watch right there, but just in case, that way we can open up just like people may have questions, right? So we have chance, potential chance to It would be terrific. I'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah, that would be really fun, you know, especially in Bay Area. 
uh, this fertility stuff and autism. It's all like huge topics in this area. And we really don't know enough. So I feel like we all need to have an open mind to understand all the other that about possibilities. You. So cool. Yeah, yeah, right? And the the general public need to know that. I know you possibly need to go, but I, I hear until now, I think the challenge is how for each person to decide what exactly is lacking, what exactly vitamin they may need, and what dosage is. Sounds like those are really tricky questions. And they are the tricky. website, workbook, possibly can help. But I guess people also need to find a specialist like you to really understand that and tailor that for their individual I, need, right? I, I need to teach other people. That's why I have these courses that I give to clinicians like you. Oh, okay. Um, if they're interested in learning it in more depth and I keep trying to try to make it available to each lay person, okay? Oh. We're, we're all resistant to having to do it ourselves because it is overwhelming. Hmm. It's just complicated, but- it's right. worth it. Right, right. Great. At the end, can you please share your website or like where our audience can find you or read more about your work? Yes, www.drgominak.com. And uh, I also have a program that allows you to, to download the workbook and join question and answer sections that we do once a month and a private Facebook group that allows you to talk to other right sleepers. So the name of the program is Right Sleep. And um, one of the things that's very satisfying for me is the people who come and ask questions have very, very good questions. And the point that I try to make to them is I know a few things. I know a few more things than other people do, but I don't know everything. That means every single person who's doing this, who has there's a lot about iron and sleep that it doesn't just have to do about restless legs. So there are right. many clinical experiences that clients have had that they report back that enlarge all of our knowledge. It's really fascinating. Yeah, the iron part actually in our board exam. When I took the board exam, there's like, I, when I learn at least, the, it's in the material. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So much more we don't know. I just feel like the more I learn about sleep, the more I don't know. <laughs> I'm thrilled that you want to learn more, Yisha, because the behavioral stuff is very important. Mm -hmm. And it's really what, what I'm doing is about all the patients who you do the best you can as a clinician, and it doesn't work as well as it did with someone else. You know, when you, you, you run up against a wall, and that's the truth for me too. Every mm -hmm. time we don't succeed, but we're willing to say, hey, would you come back and try this, okay? Then we all learn. It's really exciting. Yeah. Well, so great to have you. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, your own transformation, and all this interesting, very nuanced science and knowledge to our audience. Hopefully, this can inspire some of our audience start thinking, and at least they can also bring this question to their physicians and discuss this, right? Yeah, And you can do all of the lab tests you need on your own. You do not need a physician's order. So mm -hmm. one of the things in the workbook is there are now agencies where you can order your own labs and get back the results for 39 bucks. It's really cheap. It's exact. You do it near you at Quest, but you get the result back and you can deal with the result and you don't have to argue with your physician about it. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. Yeah. So people can find your workbook on your website. Awesome. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me let me know some dates and we'll we'll meet up again. Yeah, hold on. I'm just gonna turn. I, I said bye. Just to turn off this record.